All right. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the January Water Conditions Monitoring Committee. Um, my name is Emily Adrid, and I am with the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Um, before we get started, um, we have an announcement from Helen Silver and Nora Flynn. Um, if you want to do your little announcement, that would be awesome. Thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, hi everyone, I'm Nora, Emily's colleague at CWCB. And uh, we're gonna just do a short presentation about um, some important development around soil moisture monitoring in the state of Colorado that Helen Silver at CSU has been um, leading a uh, group of folks getting that going. So I'll turn it over to Helen to show us a few slides. And then at the end, there'll be a survey that we really hope that this group will participate in. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Nora, and the committee for having me here today. Can Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yep. Great. Fantastic. So my name's Helen Silver, and I'm co-director of the Integrated Rocky Mountain Region in the Innovation Center for Healthy Soils, uh, in Riches for short, at CSU. And I'm really excited today to talk to you about the Colorado Open Soil Moisture Infrastructure and Monitoring Project. Um, some background about this project, uh, soil moisture is likely the largest reservoir of water in the state of Colorado, so including all our lakes and rivers. Uh, and I think we all know here that monitoring is critical to a variety of factors, but including water supply management, drought prediction and response, and understanding new climate, uh, climate and precipitation norms. However, uh, the infrastructure that we have in Colorado is uh, inadequate to really uh, robustly use this data um, to meet these needs. And what I'm showing you here on the left is an image of the uh, soil moisture monitoring networks across the United States. Here in Colorado, uh, you can see that most are located along the Rocky Mountain Spine and are uh, snow tell sites. Uh, and there is some debate about whether snow tell sites are even providing representative information, uh, given that they tend to be located in wet meadows. Um, there are a few missing from this uh, graphic in the Yampa Valley. Uh, but as you can see, we've left large swaths of Colorado unrepresented. So before I dive into the objectives of this project, I want to note first that this is a first step in a long-term investment for Colorado. But um, the first objective is really to strategically expand soil moisture monitoring um, throughout the state. So really fill in those geographic gra gaps that you saw. The second objective is to develop a publicly accessible web-based tool uh, that could be used to forecast water supply and inform predictions uh, and weather-related hazard uh, prevention and management. Uh, we envision this network taking data from existing networks new networks and providing one common place. Uh, we envision that it will provide rapid real-time information to policymakers, scientists, and others, um, provide better information on current uh, conditions and future, future conditions, and really help inform science-based policy design and implementation. Uh, here is a um, graphic. I am not a great artist on how, this, uh, how we envision this working. I'll let you look at that in your own time. Uh, in terms of near-term project phases and timeline, uh, stakeholder engagement is central to the mission at Enriches. So we have been engaging in stakeholder and community efforts uh, since April, and this will continue throughout the life of the project. However, we've really ramped it up in November, December, and January. Uh, because we are really looking to the community to help us with this project uh, through two surveys. One is a survey on um, the technical aspects of existing networks. And the second is a needs assessment, which will help us really determine how to bring and expand our soil moisture going forward and design the web-based tool. So we're hoping that folks can complete this in January and February. We'll analyze the results this spring and develop a gap analysis and deployment plan. We really want to get the community feedback on that deployment plan uh, in April. 
And then we could begin deploying infrastructure as early as May or June. Uh, I want to thank our partners, collaborators, and uh, supporters and participants in this effort. Um, I see lots of faces here in, in the audience, uh, but these include the Colorado Climate Center, the Colorado River District, of course, CWCB, Aspen Global Change Institute, and the Yampa Valley Sustainability Council. Uh, and uh, Enriches is housed at the Agricultural Experiment Station at CSU. So what you can do to really help us determine and, and make sure that this project meets Colorado's needs is complete the needs assessment, which is available on these slides by February 5th, and send the survey out to your network. Um, and I invite you to participate in our stakeholder engagement meetings, uh, which will probably resume in April, and you can send me an email. And finally, uh, thank you. And uh, here are some additional resources on the project if you want to know more, as well as my contact information. And I think that's it for me. Thanks, Helen. So, so we'll get your slides um, sent out to the group with an uh, easy link for folks to participate in that survey. Great. And I, um, and you're hoping to get responses um, uh, either this month or next month, right? Yes, uh, ideally by February 5th, so we can begin um, analyzing uh, uh, what people are saying about where and for what purposes they want soil moisture monitoring. Perfect, thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Yes, thank you both Helen and Nora. That was great. And I will be sending out the slides with um, the link to the survey after this meeting. Um, all right, so let's move on to our presentations. Um, Peter from the Colorado Climate Center. Hi. Um, Good morning, Emily. Morning. Um, I, I gave you um, permission to share your screen, so um, great. go ahead. Okay, can you uh, hear me and see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. For those who may not have met me, my name is Peter Goebel, and I'm a climatologist with the Colorado Climate Center, and I'll be giving our typical uh, state climate update. Welcome, everyone, to the first update of 2024. For those who may not be familiar with the format, we're going to start with taking a look at some broad brush conditions across the state with a large emphasis on temperature and precip over recent months. We'll do a little bit of a drought conditions update, although admittedly this part's going to be a little bit shorter than normal, just because when we think about drought in the winter, a lot of what we think about is related to snow. And so I'll save that for the NRCS with your next presentation. And then I'll give a little bit of seasonal forecast info. We'll look at where we're going in the coming weeks and how things might change um, even later this spring or summer. And then I'm going to take a couple extra minutes at the end here today to talk about an update we did to the Climate Change in Colorado Synthesis for Water Managers document from 2014. Our office worked with uh, Jeff Lucas um, to create a an updated version of this with just the latest state of the science and what climate change means um, for Colorado with a specific emphasis on water. So we'll take a little bit of a look at that and I'll provide a QR code for those who may want to dig deeper with that information. All right, so we'll start with one of our quadrant charts here. We are looking at October through December temperature and precipitation conditions statewide. Here your x-axis shows the accumulated precipitation in inches and the y-axis shows the average temperature and where those dashes meet is where I believe your um, 1991 through 2020 normals are. And we can see the star marks, um, well it's 2023 but it's actually water year 2024, the first quarter of water year 2024. Um, and you can see that we're squarely in that uh, warm and dry quadrant. Now things have changed since we rolled over to calendar year 2024. 
Certainly temperature has reverted to the mean a bit and even precipitation as well. We have seen um, some rebounding numbers with our high elevation water year to date precipitation as well as seasonal snowpack since the start of the calendar year. So while we're squarely in the warm and dry here, things have gotten arguably a little bit better or a little bit closer to normal um, since then. Here's a look at just the month of December. It was a very nice, mild December, a mild start to winter, um, a bit of an easy start to winter. That said, snowpack did lag behind normal during the month of December and has since, you know, picked up, and we'll talk more about that later, or NRCS will, but we definitely had an easy start to winter at 5.6 degrees Fahrenheit above this long-term average that goes back to 1895 to 2023. And since we know that we are experiencing a warming trend, I also tried to put this in context uh, next to a more recent normal where we were 4.4 degrees Fahrenheit even still above the 1991 to 2020 normal. And you can see that our largest anomalies were um, for the most part east of the continental divide if I were to show a zoomed out view here, there were some anomalies that would absolutely leap off the charts uh, further to the north and east of us. I think the um, December temperature anomaly for the state of Minnesota was something crazy like 17.1 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, Colorado, not exactly the epicenter of this warmer than normal uh, wave that we saw throughout Dece December, but certainly a much warmer than normal start to the winter. And then this looks at October through December or that first quarter of the water year, where again, you see um, widespread above normal temperature conditions, top 10 on record throughout this long record and 2.6 degrees Fahrenheit above our most recent 30 year normal of 1991 through 2020. And then if we look at the calendar year of 2023, uh, we see that we were actually, um, well, it shows up as being on the warm side of our entire record going back to 1895 here. It was 0.3 Fahrenheit below our 1991 through 2020 normal. So that's where looking at the long-term average versus the um, more recent normals can really make a big difference. And we were well below this 91 through 2020 normal throughout the first half of water year 20, or sorry, um, calendar year 2023 but the dry, dry and warm conditions um, in the last third of the calendar year uh, really led to a lot of mean reversion there. And then here's just a time series looking at things, uh, looking at calendar year temperatures, where you can see that 2023 was a little bit on the lower side by recent standards, but certainly on the warmer side by historical standards. Like I mentioned, things have certainly changed, and I would e even hazard a strong guess that this uh, bullseye where you're seeing warmer than normal temperatures for the start of 2024 is bad data. Um, I, I feel fairly confident in that, but we can see that certainly east of the continental divide, we've had well below normal temperatures uh, to start the calendar year. Um, and the month of January, and then throughout much of the West Slopes, a little closer to normal temperatures, but still more below normal temperatures than above normal temperatures. And then uh, across a lot of Eastern Colorado, these anomalies are, are, you know, quite substantial, even as much as more than 10 degrees below our 1991 through 2020 uh, normals for the first of the month through the 21st of the month. And as we look at the, um, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, that will likely um, revert to the mean a little bit as well. But I think that we're um, looking at a very healthy shot of a cooler than normal start to the calendar year, at least with January. This is kind of how it fits into the big picture since January 1st. And this is only the first two weeks of, of the month. Um, if we were to look at January 1st through uh, present date, I believe you'd see these um, warmer than normal temperatures over the upper Midwest would be cooler than normal by this point. But we can see throughout much of the Western US, it was a cooler start um, than normal to the calendar year. 
Now taking a look at precipitation, we do see a little bit of a mix here. And this is looking at just December. So um, I, I believe it's just December. It's actually the bar at the top of the screen is blocking the label for me, but it should be December. And then, um, yeah, since the first of the month. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go back here. Um, Let's see here. Our, our ranks for December, we actually had a little bit wetter than normal out on the eastern plains, but you have to keep in mind that this is the uh, dry season for the eastern plains, whereas it's the wet season in the high country where conditions were closer to normal. And I believe that for a lot of the high country, it, it would have been a drier than normal December with um, things getting uh, wetter since the beginning of January. And then if we look at the first half of the month of January, we see that we do have, um, for much of the state, a wetter than normal start to the month where the blue and green colors are showing areas where we we're at least above the 66th percentile. And then the darker um, blue green is um, above the 90th percentile. And then this is the last calendar year. This is calendar year uh, 2023. I don't need to be able to see the label to know that because we see the footprint of uh, May and June shown prominently uh, across the Denver metro area and just to the east of the Denver metro area where we had parts of um, Adams, Arapaho, Elbert, uh, Douglas County, as well as up into Morgan and Weld counties where this was the uh, wettest year on record, and that was due in large part to what happened back in May and June. And recalling back to, you know, June, July timeframe, we were in a position where uh, snowpack had been good for the most part in 2023. It wasn't super robust everywhere in the high country, but for a lot of our high country, snowpack was good in 2023. And then we had this nice wet spring out on the plains, if you look at a US drought monitor map from um, early July of 2023, there was no drought on the map. So a lot of these uh, drier than normal precipitation um, areas that you're seeing is largely driven by what happened in the second half of the calendar year. And when I start showing US drought monitor maps, the basically all the, well, all the drought that you you see in Colorado is drought that's been put back on the map since the beginning of July. So um, definitely a tale of two halves with uh, 2023, where we started out really wet, and then we went dry for certainly the last third of the year. And you can see when we look at the precipitation time series for 2023, yes, we were above the long-term average, and we were above the 91 through 20 normal but there was quite a bit of th this um last dot in the time series if we even looked at the water year um where we're excluding october november december of this year would have jumped up more as being a wet year but we, we did see um reversion to the mean in the last uh third of this water year for sure um, this slide just shows some of the temperatures that we measured from the coagmet network throughout our cold snap that peaked with uh, some of these low temperatures on the morning of Martin Luther King Day. Uh, the coldest one in the state looks like it's the um, minus 35.2, or actually we got all the way down to minus 39.1 in Calgary. So that North Park Valley, um, often a candidate for some of our coldest temperatures in the state, but the cold anomalies would have likely been more extreme in the um, South Platte River Valley. Uh, in, in Weld County there, where we're seeing some areas that were below minus 25 or even minus 30. Uh, definitely a large cold snap in the middle of January this month. All right, so that's going to wrap up my climate conditions update, but now we're going to take a closer look at some recent uh, U.S. drought monitor maps and how things have changed. We'll look a little bit at soil moisture, although like I said, this portion of our um, updates tends to be a little bit longer and more involved during the growing season than it is uh, right now. So here's a current look at the U.S. drought monitor map across Colorado. 
A lot of this is uh, what we would call short-term drought, where it's based on impacts of less than uh, six months of dryness. But we do see that quite a bit of the state is showing at least abnormally dry with um, much of Southwest Colorado or all of Southwest Colorado, ostensibly, and at least moderate drought. And the San Luis Valley showing some severe and extreme drought, again, largely based on what we saw in the um, last six months. Um, some of those standardized precipitation index um, maps are showing some D3, D4 type SPIs in the southern portion of the San Luis Valley. This is actually a bit of an improvement over what we saw a couple weeks ago, just with some of the better snowfall totals that we've seen in the northern Rockies in the re in recent weeks, um, and snowpack coming back more towards normal values. This is a change map showing how things look now versus how they looked 12 weeks ago. The areas in uh, the warm colors or more uh, brown and, and, and beige colors, even if you get into the uh, large degradations, are, are showing areas where the U.S. drought monitor looks worse than it did 12 weeks ago. Areas in green are where it looks better. So there's more worse than better on this map, but there are a few areas across primarily western and northwest Colorado where things have improved just in the last couple weeks here. And then this is showing where we are now based uh, against where we were a year ago. And you can see that much of the eastern portion of the state looks better, largely owing to the nice wet growing season that we had. And then much of the western portion of the state looks worse because at this time last year, we already had some pretty good snowpack numbers um, whereas this time of year, the snowpack numbers that we see, and of course, NRCS will talk much more about this, um, are on the lower side of normal, particularly in that southwest portion of the state. All right, here's a look at uh, soil moisture, and this is kind of zoomed out, but we're looking at zero through 100 centimeter soil moisture percentile, valid as of this morning. Um, from the NASA sport group, um, modeling group. We do typically have more zoomed in maps for Colorado. I just haven't had time to make those this week as we had an all day meeting yesterday, but we can see that there's a number of uh, areas across the state that are showing um, higher than average soils. And particularly in Western Colorado, that's something to watch just given that soil moisture can soak up some of the snowpack that would have otherwise gone into runoff come the uh, runoff season. Uh, it's interesting to note that the drier than normal, the much drier than normal soil moisture conditions in Northeast Colorado really follow the South Platte River Valley. And I would hazard a guess that the reason for that is that in the river valley, the soils tend to be uh, quite sandy. And because of that, things uh, drain more quickly and you see more of a short-term reaction to dry conditions versus the areas that we have uh, more loams or clays are better at holding on to um, moisture that may still be around from a wetter or much wetter than uh, normal spring. But for the most part, the wetter than normal soil moistures that would have been at least temporarily associated with May and, and June, uh, we're, we're probably past that now. All right, with that, um, I, I think that's gonna conclude what I, what I have for the drought update, but now I'm going to go ahead and show some slides regarding the outlook for the coming weeks and months. We'll start with just the seven day precip outlook, then we'll look at the next couple weeks, and then we'll talk about um, more of a seasonal outlook and how that may be influenced by what we're seeing with uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation or the current El Nino conditions that we have and what might happen to those going forward. Overall, it looks like the next seven days will largely um, err on the dry side. 
it looks like we could have a little bit of a weather system move through uh, that gives a little bit of moisture to the southeast quadrant of the state but it'll be a drier than normal week for our Colorado Rockies. Um, the San Juans in particular may see a little bit of moisture this week, but it won't be as much as even a normal week for this time of year. Those are areas where you need to see an inch of moisture per week this time of year really to um, keep up with normal. And then uh, where we have this low here um, up over Buffalo Pass, the fact that it's uh, one point, almost 1.6 inches below normal for the forecast for the um, coming seven days tells you about how wet that area is climatologically, that um, somewhere could be over an inch and a half below normal uh, for one week of precipitation, um, whereas much of our eastern plains sees, uh, in many cases, less than 1.5 inches of precipitation for January, uh, December, and February combined. Okay, here's a look at our 8 to 14 day outlook. We do still see quite a bit of um, milder air across the continental U.S. where it is expected to be a warmer than normal week, but particularly the back half of this um, time frame, we do start to see some changes that will both cool things down, but also definitely raise the probability of receiving more moisture. Um, it does look like there uh, is, is likely to be some sort of an atmospheric river event in a lot of our um, weather models sometime uh, between about February 3rd and February 7th, where we should we should see a good corridor of moisture come up from the Pacific Ocean and hit somewhere along the West Coast. But of course, at this um, with this much lead time, it's still a little bit fuzzy as to what extent that will impact Colorado. I would bet on it impacting Colorado in one way or another. But that doesn't necessarily mean it'll favor your portion of the state. Some of the model runs that we're looking at show a nice big snowfall event over the southeastern uh, plains of Colorado, whereas some show more of a mountain snow event. So it's a little bit early to know who is going to benefit from this. But there is definitely some optimism that we could see above normal moisture at some point in the first week of February. I'll be at Steamboat for part of that time, so I'm hoping that it shifts north, but we will see what happens. Now, as we get beyond that eight to 14 day range, at that point, our atmospheric weather condition models really uh, descend into chaos. We're just um, small errors in the inputs in the initial conditions to the model can lead to large errors over time. So you have to rely more on uh, how the atmosphere tends to react uh, statistically to slower moving um, parts of the Earth's climate system, like the um, ocean surface and the ocean surface temperature patterns that we see being the biggest example, but also um, land surface temperature and moisture patterns. And this time of year, the big thing tends to be what's going on over the um, tropical equatorial uh, eastern Pacific. Do we have warmer than normal waters over that area or cooler than normal waters. We certainly have warmer than normal waters over the eastern equatorial Pacific, and we are in an El Nino event right now. And that tends to have impacts on what happens with our jet stream up in the mid latitudes of the northern hemisphere, where during a La Nina, you tend to see a strong, one stronger, more unified jet stream that goes further to the north. Whereas in El Nino, you get a weaker jet stream with split flow that can bring uh, a little bit more moisture um, to the southern U.S. And this is a look at a breakdown by season of the statistical correlation between El Nino and precipitation. Um, the upper left is December, January, February. Upper right is March, April, May. Lower left is June, July, August. Lower right is September, October, November. Areas that are blue, which is basically only the Rockies, Northern Rockies in particular during December, January, February, are actually uh, wetter during La Nina. They tend to 
um, get more small storm events that just add up during that time frame versus El Nino is um, more likely to produce some of these strong surface lows that we sometimes see across southern Colorado or more of the four corner low or panhandle hook type setups that will more likely bring um, blizzards to the eastern portion of, of the state. And in fact, we see that eastern Colorado favors El Nino in every season. And in spring, the whole state favors El Nino. So if we can hold on to El Nino conditions, El Nino is often or more likely than not associated with we may fall behind with snowpack early, but we can make it up late. So we're kind of hoping to hold on to those El Nino conditions. Unfortunately, some of the uh, models for what might happen with El Nino going forward do show it breaking down by the time we get into uh, March, April, May. How quickly this breaks down um, will make a difference most likely in what type of spring that we see from a precipitation standpoint. We've got a 100% chance of holding on to El Nino through at least this uh, kind of January, February, March timeframe. But as we lean into April and especially April, May, the odds of things reverting back to, to neutral start to really creep up close to 50%. And then by the time we get into um, early summer, late spring, the odds of going neutral uh, go well above 50%. So we'll see how long these conditions um, hold on. So here's a look at the uh, Climate Prediction Center outlook for um, February. We um, do see a fairly El Nino-like signal with temperature here where we have above normal conditions to the north. And this near normal would normally be, be below normal, but I believe that's um, increased confidence in near normal largely because there's this trend towards uh, warmer than normal temperatures. And then we, we also see um, a fairly El Nino-like signal with a uh, below normal precip in the Ohio River Valley and above normal to the south of that. But we have a lot of uh, equal chances across the state of Colorado or um, what we like to call equally clueless. I kind of think that I should have put an up arrow in green across eastern Colorado because this was issued in the middle of January. And, you know, only five days have passed since then, but we know a lot more about this um, up coming uh, first week of February, where if we do get a decent snowstorm across eastern Colorado, it doesn't take much to go above normal in February. Um, you can see that there is the signal towards above normal uh, for the southwest U.S. that doesn't quite extend into Colorado. If we do get one of those um, atmospheric river events in the first week of February, Hopefully that'll have an impact on the mountains as well. But since normal conditions are higher in the mountains for February, I feel much less confident saying we could stretch that green all the way across Western Colorado um, based on one precipitation event, because we're certainly going to need more than just that one event. Go above normal. But we'll see what happens. Here's a look at, uh, there's a little bit of that um, El Nino signal across Eastern Colorado showing up in the Climate Prediction Center seasonal outlook. Um, although it's not as, it's not present further to uh, the West, that's where really we would need El Nino to hold on into March, April, May to start talking about maybe showing increased uh, chances of above normal precip across a greater portion of the state. Um, and then if, if we look at March, April, May, you see that actually diminishes a little bit. And I think it's largely because uh, there's, there's a chance that the El Nino kind of collapses before we really get into April, May, where maybe you could extend this further across the state if we knew that El Nino was going to hang on. But we don't know that at this point. Uh, if you look at summer, that tends to be less correlated with El Nino, La Nina, and these forecasts are more just based on trend, where it's a good reminder that we really do need those nice spring rains um, and spring snowfall events in the mountains because we have these statistically significant trends, particularly in summer, towards above normal temperatures and in some cases even uh, below normal precip. In, in summer, although that's a little bit less certain, but 
Uh, warmer conditions also lead to higher evaporation and transpiration rates, so we lose the moisture uh, more quickly. So we're certainly rooting for an above normal uh, spring in, in terms of moisture, knowing that more likely than not, we're uh, probably going to have a warmer than normal summer. So just some takeaways before I launch into my last couple slides talking about the climate change and Colorado synthesis work that we've done. Um, 2023, if we look at some of those calendar year uh, graphics from earlier, our, was cooler and wetter than recent climate normals or our kind of 1991 to 2020 uh, climate averages. But the last quarter or third of the year was significantly warmer and drier than normal. So it does not leap off the charts in the way that it did uh, earlier on in the calendar year. Um, January is certainly off to a cooler than normal start. And we have seen improving uh, precipitation and snowfall in the mountains since the start of the calendar year, which is encouraging because we were uh, falling into a uh, pretty significant deficit right around um, New Year's time frame. So it's, it's good that we've made some of that up. Um, the current drought depiction you see in Colorado is based on what's happened since July, since we were uh, sort of in a surplus situation at that point for moisture, but a lot of especially Western Colorado has dried out since then. And then El Nino conditions do persist over the Pacific Ocean which gives us some optimism for spring, but if El Nino collapses, then we're in uh, more of a situation where things uh, could go either way or it becomes more of a 50-50 proposition. Uh, but we do have, just based on trends, some higher confidence that once we get into the warm season, we're likely to have uh, warmer conditions and maybe even a tilt toward drier than normal conditions. So spring rain will be important, not telling anyone anything they don't know with that sentence, but it's, you know, maybe more true now than ever. Okay, so like I mentioned, the QR code here will give you uh, access to our climate change in Colorado synthesis report update. And I'm just going to show a couple of the highlights. This report was divided into kind of three sections where the first couple chapters are looking at trends in temperature and precipitation, uh, both in uh, the observations that we've made uh, from weather stations across the state, and then um, temperature and precipitation projections from climate models. So you get a, a bit of a mix of what we see from both those data sources. And then chapter three is all about water, where we're looking at potential changes in snowpack by the mid to late century and what that means for our runoff season, as well as what that means for soil moisture and evaporative demand. And then chapter four of this report is largely about how a warmer climate changes the probability of various weather hazards that we experience across the state. So I'm just going to show a one slide um, kind of teaser for each of these chapters starting with temperature where people who attend uh, these, these um, meetings regularly won't be surprised by this, but both in our recent observations, we see a trend towards warmer than normal temperatures across the state, as well as uh, our climate model projections showing a high degree of confidence that that will continue. Whereas, you know, we have a weaker trend towards lower than uh, historically average precipitation recently, but climate models are quite agnostic on whether or not that will continue with the average in climate models even being a little bit higher than recent normals by um, the middle of this century. Uh, a couple other details from this chapter, we did most, for, for the climate change projections, we focused on the RCP 4.5 scenarios, which is basically a middle of the road warming scenario. We uh, didn't lean into either the optimistic scenarios that show large mitigation or reductions in uh, CO2 emissions, but we didn't lean into the 8.5 scenario that really uh, shows a, a, a pretty steep increase in the um, output of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere um, 
globally. So in a way, the true range of variability that um, we may be facing is, is not fully captured in this report since we uh, largely stuck to the middle of the road emissions one bullet point that that's interesting here is um, both in observations and in, in climate models, uh, there's there's more of a robust warming trend in the summer and fall than winter and spring. And in, in recent years, that does seem like that has been uh, been true. Um, here is a look at a time series for precipitation statewide where we can see that we've certainly had more than our share of drought years since 2000, but the overall long-term trend in precipitation is a little bit less clear. And like I mentioned, climate models uh, tend to show e either a weak um, moistening or a weak drying, but they, they don't show nearly as significant of trends as we see in um, temperature. But one of the interesting highlights here is that a lot of climate models do show a little bit of a change in seasonality here, where our our winters are more likely than not to get wetter, and our summers are more likely than not to get drier. But the year-to-year -year or interannual variability will continue to be extremely important, perhaps even more important going forward. And that doesn't mean that we should just expect magically that every winter will be wet and every summer will be dry, because that certainly will not be the case either. And then this uh, this slide is a little bit of a teaser for our um, chapter on water and really following snowpack runoff and, and stream flow and soil moisture and evaporative demand, kind of um, looking through the water cycle at what the literature says we may be able to expect by the middle or end of the century, where we see, you know, there's, there's a recent trend towards lower spring snowpack and Climate models do back that up, but the confidence maybe isn't quite as high as you might expect, because if we do see an increase in wintertime precipitation, like some of these models are showing, then this may not be so cut and dry. Whereas um, the runoff timing being earlier, there's more confidence there because that's dependent on temperature and there the trends are much more robust. Again, with stream flow, confidence only at medium towards lower because it really depends on, well, do we see um, wetter conditions at crucial times of year? But then as we get into summertime soil moisture and evaporative demand, again, those are strongly dependent on temperature. Uh, so you get uh, more confidence in the trend. This graphic here, the x-axis shows uh, temperature change by the middle of the century. The uh, y-axis shows precipitation change, where uh, each circle is the output from one climate model. And the punchline here is really a bet on a warmer future is a bet on a drier future, because only the blue circles are models where uh, stream flow was projected to increase. And you can kind of draw an imaginary line here where roughly, and, and again, I'm not saying this is necessarily linear, but roughly for every uh, three degrees that we warm, you would need, or for every one degree that we warm, you'd need a 2% increase in precipitation to uh, kind of keep up with the runoff that we've seen historically. So certainly um, something to think about and, and prepare for, but also think about all these uh, different range of, of projections that, that we may see. And then when it comes to weather hazards, we see a um, kind of wide array of outcomes here where uh, certainly heat waves are strongly tied to just this increasing trend in temperature. So very high confidence, both in the trend observed and projected um, changes that heat waves are likely to be uh, increasing. Cold waves, interestingly, um, you know, recent, recent trends, at least going back to the 1950s or so, we're seeing fewer than we used to and projections are for that to continue. But the confidence is lower here where a number of climate models still show that we uh, we, we can see some pretty darn cold air um, and end of this century. So the cold waves like what we experienced this month don't totally go away, that's, that's, uh, that's for sure. And then um, drought and wildfire, of course, those are things that are tied to temperature. temperature so you see higher confidence there. 
And then if you look at some of these um, severe weather outcomes, you see um, largely lower confidence. And when it comes to things like hail, tornadoes, and severe thunderstorms, we have reason to expect that climate change and warmer temperatures could increase the probability of seeing certain ingredients necessary to make these uh, weather events happen, but also decreases in other ingredients that tend to lead to um, severe thunderstorms, hail, and tornado uh, tor tornado um, outbreaks. So lower confidence when it comes to some of the more severe weather uh, hazard. All right, that's going to do it for me. Thanks so much uh, for your time, everyone. If there's any questions, comments, I'd Certainly be happy to field those before we uh, move on, but that, that should do it for my update. Oh, thanks so much, Peter. Um, if anybody yeah, has questions, feel free to put them in the chat or on mute. Also, Peter, could you put the link to the report in the chat? Yes, awesome. I'll go ahead and do that. All right, well, if there's no questions, um, we can move on to our next presentation. But before we do that, I wanted to, I forgot to mention this earlier, but if you weren't able to attend our last meeting in November, um, I made a little announcement that we've rebranded the name of this group. So, um, you know, previously we were the Water Availability Task Force or WATF, and now we are the uh, Water Conditions Monitoring Committee or WCMs. And the reason behind this name change is because the name task force um, implies a group that convenes, does a task, and then disbands. But um, that's not really what this group does. We're, we're an ongoing standing meeting, so the new name matches um, the real function of this group. So I wanted to just note that for everyone in case there's any confusion. Um, the function and, you know, routine of this meeting will stay the exact same. We just have a new name. Um, also, if you haven't already, um, it would be great if you could put your name and affiliation in the chat, please. Um, and our next presentation is from Brian um, from NRCS. Brian, are you on the call? I see your name here. Hi, Brian. I certainly am. I uh, turned on my video before the mute. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, good, how are you? Well, thank you. All right, I'm going to share my screen here and get the presentation started. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I am presenting from a rather unfamiliar location here. Um, I'm on travel this week with a bunch of people from our program uh, providing some training. Uh, and uh, at a time or two during Peter's uh, presentation, which is always great, uh, really appreciate that, Peter. Um, I was having a little bit of connection trouble, so hopefully I don't have any issues. Uh, let me know if I do. Um, but I think in general, the connection has been pretty stable. So um, if it's not, I can uh, turn off my video and um, hopefully that'll improve it a little bit. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, gonna do the typical round robin around all the basins of the state and then get into kind of um, statewide conditions. And the statewide conditions really provides the, the, the best kind of rounding um, in terms of uh, the best summary of what's going on and even kind of dives in a little bit into some of the, the, the specifics in, in some of the basins. Um, but uh, it's good to go through each one of the basins uh, and, and introduce um, a lot of what we're the conditions we're seeing. So, as we typically do, start off in the uh, Yampa White and North Platte basins. The reasons we the reason we um, combine those basins is because in general they tend to behave uh, the same uh, or experience weather patterns similarly. Uh, so we combine those, even though uh, the the two basins flow into um, uh, very different oceans. Um, so starting off and looking at the uh, Yampa and White combined basins, uh, 
Snowpack as of yesterday, when I updated this presentation, and as you're looking, as we're looking at these maps, uh, here's where you'll look uh, for the updated date. I did go through to make sure that all of the slides that I put in here were in fact uh, updated as of yesterday. Uh, hopefully I didn't make any mistakes or miss anything, but uh, I did not update them this morning. Uh, it usually takes me a, at least a few hours to update uh, this presentation. So I took care of that yesterday. And as I was mentioning, uh, and as Peter mentioned, uh, the storms that we received in the earlier part of January uh, definitely gave us a good boost. Um, we were in very much in need of that boost. Uh, unfortunately, I would argue, and I think many others monitoring the situation across the entire state, the, the boost that we received was not quite as, as much as we would have liked to have seen, um, mainly because the deficit in snowpack that we saw or we were experiencing prior to or prior to January, in the beginning part of January before the storms hit, um, the snowpack was quite low. Um, and and the storm that we received uh, in most areas boast, boosted snowpack, you know, 20 to 30 percent. But when we're 60 percent of normal for snowpack and we get a 30 percent boost, that only puts us at about 90 percent of normal. You'll see the conditions are a little bit better than that in some locations, but that's just a, a general um, kind of example of what we've been seeing. And in the case of the Yampa and White basins, um, the, the conditions were, I think, about 60 to 70 percent of normal, and then we got about a 30 percent boost, so to speak. And here we are, we're looking at conditions between, you know, 93 and uh, 95 percent of normal in the, the Yampa and White basins. And then in the North Platte, uh, the conditions were much the same. Uh, they were below normal, and then we received um, some good snows there those last uh, two, three weeks. Uh, and now um, that atmospheric river has stopped, and uh, we're, we haven't seen much improvement since. So in looking at these um, time series graphs, you'll see that this really is the best way to view how significant the improvement was. And what I would like to point out uh, is the green line here in the back is the median value. So median, of course, is where uh, uh, values typically stand based on uh, historical period of records. And the black line is uh, this year is 2024. So you can see that in the beginning part of January, uh, snowpack was quite low. Uh, I, probably more uh, better uh, described with uh, significantly low, if not near record low. Not all basins were near record low, but the Yampa, White, and Little Snake combined basins uh, was near record low, you know, very, very close. Uh, and then we've got, uh, we received those storms, that storm track that we saw from this atmospheric river was particularly beneficial to uh, the Yampa and the White, the Park Range, uh, the Park Mountain Range, and the basins to the north. Uh, and you'll see here in future slides that the basins to the south did not see uh, quite the improvement that the uh, northern basin saw. So you can see that we went from pretty much record low to right near normal. Uh, we did for a while match up with that uh, normal or median line. I'm using uh, normal and median synonymously in this case, but we have since dried out a little bit and uh, you can see that now uh, snowpack across the entire combined Yampa White and Little Snake Basins is 98% of normal. Sorry, my cursor continues to disappear. So you can see, look for, as we're going through these graphics and these graphs, uh, the percent of median value can be found on this second line in this text box. One last thing to point out uh, right now, I will not necessarily point them out throughout the remainder of these time series slides, but I did try to go through and pull out uh, similar years uh, in the case of the combined Yampa White Little Snake. I did put 2023 on there and the remainder I did not, uh, but I did try to find uh, the most similar year to this year at this point. Um, in terms of uh, the particular uh, trace that we're looking at this year. So in precipitation, I selected uh, the uh, very similar year. And here in this case, 2016 uh, is the most similar year. I, I went back on average about 15 to 20 years uh, to find what the most similar year is, just to kind of put it in context for those uh, of us who have been around for a little while. Okay, I'm gonna start going faster through these slides. Um, Precipitation in the combined uh, Yampa White and Little Snake is fortunately slightly above normal. Again, really nothing to write home about. 102% of normal is right in that range. Uh, did see a good improvement. Precipitation here was not quite as low as it was for snowpack, 
um, but it was still pretty low flirting with uh, that 10th percentile. Looking at Streamflow forecast based on our January 1 data, keep in mind uh, Streamflow forecast are based on beginning of the month data. So January 1, February 1, March 1, and so forth. Uh, so come February 1, uh, we will uh, quality control our data, pull in reservoir and other information, Streamflow data, and then generate our Streamflow forecasts, which are typically published on about the fifth working day of each month uh, here. Uh, for the January 1 Streamflow forecasts. Um, you can see that in general, Streamflow forecasts were largely below normal. So you can see the median line here in the light gray. And then looking at the most probabilistic outcome, the 50% exceedance, which is uh, in the green area or the middle of all of these uh, lines or ranges of forecasts that we provide. That's the most probabilistic outcome, but we have to remember that it is quite unlikely that the actual outcome will be right at that 50% exceedance. It more than likely will be somewhere in here, and it is most likely to occur uh, that it will be, for example, this outcome, but realistically, it will be somewhere in this range, right? If you have any questions about Streamflow forecasts, do not hesitate to reach out to us. Here again, uh, Streamflow forecasts are, are looking uh, to be below normal based on those January 1 conditions. And I'll go into some of the improvements that we saw uh, at the end in our state, uh, the statewide slides. You'll see how, uh, how much we improved and then might be able to extrapolate uh, what uh, Streamflow forecasts we may anticipate come February 1, at least based on the conditions that we're seeing right now. Uh, in the Laramie and North Platte basins, again, an improvement. Uh, precipitation is now at 97% of normal. Uh, and then combined reservoir storage uh, for the three reservoirs in uh, the Yampa White and Little Snake basins are all very close to normal. You can see um, that uh, the terminus on the right uh, for, uh, which is uh, January 1 uh, and the reservoir storage that we collected data for are all showing very close to the median line, which is the black line in the middle. Streamflow forecast in the Laramie and White Basin, we only have one streamflow forecast and that's uh, the North Platte at North, North Gate. Uh, again, looking at below normal runoff there might be a slight improvement based on the snowpack improvements that we saw, but um, it wasn't quite the improvement that we wanted to see, as I mentioned before. Uh, another way to look at those streamflow forecasts, just showing them graphically here, here's that uh, North Platte at Ridgegate, and then a number of the other forecasts off uh, on the west side of the divide in the Yampa White. Moving on into the uh, headwaters of Colorado, where we realized uh, the biggest improvements from uh, the snowstorm and where uh, snowpack is actually the best in the state right now. Uh, giving a little bit of a breakdown of the greater basin, looking at some of the individual basin, uh, yeah, the individual basins, uh, you can see that uh, the best snowpack is in the uh, Colorado uh, Kremlin, excuse me, speaking too fast, Colorado Kremlin and the Glenwood Springs area. Uh, some of those uh, sites um, really kind of one uh, is showing better, uh, uh, better snowpack, but largely across the basin conditions are, are relatively consistent um, near to near normal with with um, with some variation on the, the bounds. You see a few yellow sites and a few blue sites, but largely uh, in between the 90 and 110 percent of normal. Uh, snowpack, according to this particular graphic, is 99% of normal in the Colorado headwaters. Again, uh, looking right here at this number. And then precipitation across the basin is 103% of the year-to-date normal. And most com closely compares at this point to 2015. Reservoir storage uh, for all of the reservoirs in the basin are relatively close to normal. If you uh, are familiar with a reservoir that um, is one that you typically rely on, uh, hopefully you see that. And then looking at the, the basin-wide um, trend over the last uh, 30 or so years, um, plus years, you can see that over the last year and change, we've been slightly above normal and we remain slightly above normal with a slight uptick since last, last month in all of the reservoirs combined in the Colorado headwaters. Stream flow forecast for January 1, uh, again, based on that January 1 data uh, shows that stream flow forecasts were uh, 
more than likely going to be below normal. Um, but hopefully with uh, the improvement that we saw, we'll see a little bit of a boost. I doubt with some of the dry conditions that Peter said we can expect and the fact that it has been dry since the storms, I, I don't expect these streamflow forecasts to be quite at normal uh, come February 1. And then looking at streamflow forecasts graphically as of January 1, you can see those here again below normal. Moving further east into the South Platte River Basin, uh, snowpack here too did benefit from the uh, storms that we saw in earlier January, um, but not so much in the southern half of the basin, which has actually been a trend here. Let me go back, excuse me. Uh, we have been seeing a, a bit of a stratification or um, uh, impacts uh, have been affecting portions of the basin differently uh, in the mountains. Uh, a number of the storms that come from the northwest seem to impact the northern portion of the basin, but not so much the southern portion of the basin, the headwaters of the South Platte. Uh, you can see a slight bias to that here with, with some of these sites um, to the south, but largely this particular storm was uh, relatively consistent uh, for, uh, for the, the greater South Platte, but did show some of those indications of below. Um, lesser accumulations in the southern half of the basin. Uh, basin wide in the South Platte, snowpack is 98% of normal. Uh, again, we were relatively low, not quite record low, but uh, bumped right back near to normal. And now we're at 98% of normal. Snowpack again, most closely compares at this point to 2015. And then year to day precipitation is a good bit lower here, 92% of normal. Um, and we just didn't see uh, quite the improvement. And uh, it is a, a very typical phenomenon, actually, uh, to see conditions where uh, the precipitation accumulations were not quite as significant as the snowpack accumulations. That can happen for a number of reasons. Um, some have some of those reasons may have to do with our sensors, but usually do not. Uh, a lot of that snow can actually uh, accumulate on one side of the basin and blow into another side of the basin. Um, it is possible. Um, and sometimes it doesn't quite register as precipitation. It can be blow over from, from snow. The fact of the matter is, is that we do measure that because it is an actual representation of snowpack uh, and, and does represent the true uh, snowpack and conditions that are on the ground. Reservoir storage in the entire South Platte, you can see all the individual uh, reservoirs here indicated. And then give it one more second, because there's a lot of reservoirs on this graph. Um, looking at the combined basin, uh, you can see, sorry, I, for me, this is clipped out by um, uh, the uh, view from Zoom. Uh, reservoir storage is near to slightly above normal here. It's been tra uh, tracking above normal. And let me see if I can move this for myself. And it is it is still above normal. It has ticked down since last month, but um, still about uh, more than 50,000 acre feet uh, above the typical median. Streamflow forecast, I had to divide this up into two separate slides because there's so many streamflow forecasts. Uh, uh, are relatively below normal. Again, I do not think that uh, the accumulations that we saw will uh, uh, propel those February 1 forecasts to above normal. And then the other half showing here. And then uh, viewing the streamflow forecasts um, on the map here. Uh, most streamflow forecasts were uh, around 80% of normal, but ranged from about 70% uh, of normal to about 90% of normal. Uh, as of January 1. Okay, moving into the Gunnison snowpack and the Gunnison uh, was, or uh, did improve uh, a bit. Again, uh, the uh, preference for the most recent storm tracks uh, did not really benefit the, the southern basins. The Gunnison is really one of those basins that's kind of in the middle of the state. And especially when you get further west in the basin and the north, you will see some of those improvements uh, as those storm tracks tend to prefer. But when you're on the, the southern half of the basin, um, the, the improvements just uh, weren't quite there. Uh, However, snowpack uh, in the upper end of the Gunnison River Basin does look relatively good at 105% of normal, whereas the lower part of the basin is about 90% of normal, give or take. And here you can see uh, the improvements 
in the black line, which to, again, 2024, snowpack is at 94% of normal uh, across the state, but has, uh, did again, was not at near that record low, but, but did see an improvement. And uh, again, does most, most closely compare with 2015. Precipitation water year to date is uh, at a hundred percent of normal. Uh, one of the reasons for that is uh, there was some good um, uh, precipitation in the Southern half of the state earlier on in the year, particularly in the Gunnison. And uh, you can see that we were not quite as low, not down to that 10th percentile. So it didn't take as much to boost us up to near normal and, and things have been tracking um, relatively well for year to date precipitation in the Gunnison. Uh, reservoir storage uh, did not have time to dig in since the April, or excuse me, <laughs> since the November meeting to determine exactly why Fruitland is as high as it is. Um, but I believe that it is valid data. I think that we did check that it is valid. And all the other reservoirs are, are relatively, uh, some of the other reservoirs are relatively close to normal. There are three others that are relatively low and don't know why those are low. Good part is uh, reservoir storage for the entire basin is uh, very close to normal. I'm not sure exactly what that number is. I don't uh, have it here, uh, but good to see that uh, entire basin storage in the reservoir in the Gunnison River Basin is very close to normal. Again, looking at those stream flow forecasts, uh, some of them are uh, looking better than some of the other basins that we've seen. I don't think that will continue. I'm assuming that like, for example, Tamichi Creek near Sargent's, that one actually could come down or stay there, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did bump down a little bit with some of the low soil moistures that we have. And I'm looking at the lower half of this graphic, uh, those stream flow forecasts are below normal. Looking at the stream flow forecast uh, based on the map, you can see here that uh, again, uh, favorable in the west, north, but less so in the east, or excuse me, favorable in the east and north and less so in the west and south. Okay, moving into the southwest corner of the state, uh, snowpack, uh, again, did see some improvements, uh, not spectacular improvements. Um, would like to have seen at least another 20% boost, you know, go from the 80 to 90 range. Uh, and then uh, would have liked to have seen it get into the, the 90 to or 100 to 110 range. That's where we would really like to be or even more, um, but just didn't get it out of the last storm. Here again, you can see that boost and shows that snowpack is 80% of normal. Uh, precipitation. Uh, again, running low, 73% of normal here in the combined San Miguel, Dolores, San Juan basins. Uh, reservoir storage for the major reservoirs that we collect data for as of January 1. And you can see that the uh, time series trace for combined reservoir storage is below normal and has been tracking below normal for um, looks like about, I think it's about a half a decade or a little less than that. So hopefully we can get a boost. And there here are no surprise stream flow forecasts uh, where things have been relatively dry are below normal and will probably continue to trend that way. Um, hopefully we will see a boost in these stream flow forecasts with uh, the snowpack that we saw. Do not see it getting close to normal, but uh, we might see a little bit of a boost. And then here's those stream flow forecasts um, looking at the map. Moving on into the Rio Grande. Um, we're trying to improve our maps a little bit to uh, not necessarily highlight or I should say color the areas where there's not um, too much snowfall. It, it's a bit of a balance to, uh, to achieve uh, when mapping out where snowpack is influential uh, and where it's not. So that's why this graphic is the way that it is. And I decided to uh, provide um, not, I, I try I, decided to provide uh, the breakdown of the sub-basins within there as opposed to just one, you know, say, uh, yellow uh, basin highlight uh, to provide a, a more descript um, and specific detailed uh, out, output of what snowpack looks like across the Rio Grande Band. And you can see here that uh, conditions, as is the case in the southern half of the state, not that great. Uh, not much of an improvement from those storms. Um, the, the Northwest track uh, does not really seem to benefit. That Western track actually doesn't really seem to benefit uh, the, the upper Rio Grande and snowpack is at 69% of normal. Uh, 
most closely compares to about 2013, not as bad as 2012, fortunately. And then precipitation year to date is 74% of normal. Reservoir storage in the Rio Grande is below normal um, and uh, continental re reservoir things are looking better, but still, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, I was thinking of the, the previous basin. Uh, I think because of continental reservoir storage is a bit better uh, than average in the upper Rio Grande. Stream flow forecasts. Again, this is another graphic that's divided into two. Um, below normal, no real surprise there. And then further below normal as you get further down in the basin. Usually our um, these stream flow forecast graphics that we have uh, start higher up in the basin. Uh, Rio Grande 30 mile is, is the highest one up uh, in the headwaters and then we work our way down in most cases into the basin. Looking at those forecasts graphically, here you can see that again, here's the upper end of the basin here in the west, and then uh, Rio Grande flows down and out to New Mexico. Okay, uh, last sub basin in the state, the Arkansas um, snowpack uh, is a bit better in the, the northern uh, portion of the basin. Um, and kind of uh, really helping the basin along if, if uh, the upper end of the basin where the majority of the snowpack really winds up uh, accumulating, uh, the, the Sangre de Cristos really don't carry that much snowpack in general, but the upper end of the basin does carry more. Um, so the upper end of the basin really kind of is carrying the basin uh, and, and really keeping it um, higher uh, on its numbers. But if, if things were to dry out here in the upper end of the Arkansas, we would probably see a significant decline in stream flow forecasts. Um, so this year, snowpack compares most closely to actually the last two years, 2023 and 2022, where snowpack is currently 81% of normal as of yesterday morning. And uh, precipitation is a little bit better at 94% normal um, and most closely compares to last year, actually very, very similar to last year at this point. Reservoir storage. Um, I think is looking pretty good uh, for the combined basins or for the combined reservoir, excuse me. And then, yeah, it is a bit, it is above normal. And I'll have these numbers in a slide uh, later on here in the state update, which is coming up here shortly. Stream flow forecast, not surprisingly, are um, below normal, particularly in the lower end of the basin, but looking close to normal uh, for Chalk Creek at Nathrop um, here at Mount Princeton right now. And Chalk Creek is flowing pretty well. And then uh, looking at those forecasts on the map. Okay, statewide, um, I put the stream flow for, or excuse me, I put the snowpack for um, uh, January 6th here. I wanted to show the improvements of what we were seeing before the storm pattern set in here in early January and after. So here's a breakdown of uh, the sub basins, the Huck 8 basins within Colorado. You can see that uh, the, the situation was pretty bleak earlier. And then uh, looking at it from uh, a Huck 6 standpoint, um, here you see those numbers. Uh, by the way, the, the summary numbers, of course, on these graphics, uh, I don't have the percents of normals for the individual sites, but uh, the basin-wide numbers usually are, are show up a little bit more um, uh, bolded for future reference. And then moving here to yesterday morning, January 22nd, um, you can see here again the improvement. Where's my cursor? Uh, the the improvement in the northern half of the state was um, was good. Not not as much as we quite would have liked to have seen, but definitely saw an improvement. Southern half of the state not quite so much, but it was still an improvement. We'll take it. Uh, more particularly, it was in the western portion of the state. Eastern side uh, didn't see much at all in the Arkansas. They did see some, uh, but not too much. And then looking at it from the the major basin standpoint. Uh, you can see, as I mentioned earlier, Colorado Headwaters is 103% of normal. That's where the biggest improvement was. And then um, we're right at, uh, I'd consider that right at normal in the South Platte, Yampa White, and the combined Laramie North Platte, and then less so in the Southern half. Statewide uh, really does show an improvement. What we saw, uh, again, not flirting with, with record low, but uh, we were near about that 10 percentile and got pretty close to normal, but not quite there. 92% of normal. 
here uh, for the statewide number for snowpack and most closely compares to 2010 and 2012 or excuse me I should yeah uh, 2012 at this point um, we saw a little bit of a boost that made it seem like we were a little bit closer but uh, after that you know there there wasn't uh, much accumulation beyond that and I know 2012 uh, for those of us who have been around here for a while uh, stands out in our mind as a, as a pretty dry year and one that melted out early um, no not saying by any means that this is an indication that this could be uh, like 2012 um, but just putting some traces in there where things are similar Year-to-date precipitation is 91% of normal um, and drying out a little bit, but hopefully we'll get that uh, weather pattern that uh, Peter was indicating we will hopefully have here in early February. Uh, statewide precip is showing 91% of normal. Again, and again, better in the, the northern half of the state. And then, so highlighting the improvements that we have seen since January 1. So looking at the improvements from January 1 to 20, uh, to, to yesterday morning, uh, which it says January 21st here, uh, but that's the end of the day on January 21st. Um, this is month to date precipitation, and you can see that it was a, a, a great improvement. Um, most of the basins uh, saw that improvement. Um, and we got to remember that uh, this time of year, uh, snowpack does accumulate um, relatively consistently, but it winds up accumulating more in the northern half of the state. So in terms of total uh, value of accumulated water, uh, those uh, the improvements in the northern half of the state, um, that's what I'm talking about being a little bit better up there. And actually, I guess I stand corrected. I didn't realize the Arkansas saw. Um, saw 205% uh, of normal. I think it is usually pretty dry here, which is why it was able to achieve 200% um, of normal accumulation. Um, this is a stack graph. This is another way I wanted to um, put in perspective the improvement that we saw here in the beginning part of January. Uh, so these stack graphs indicate uh, each month's precipitation accumulation over the course of the year. So uh, as you can see from the legend over here, October is on the bottom, November, January, February, or excuse me, uh, I don't know my months, October, November, December, January. And I'm pointing out here that, that as of yesterday morning, we had accumulated 3.4 inches of precipitation through uh, the course of January. Uh, the normal for the entire portion of January uh, for the median, uh, is 2.7. So you can see we well exceeded that. However, uh, last year we had a great January. We had 5.1 inches of precipitation. Um, so we haven't quite uh, measured up to January accumulation in 2023, uh, but we were, we're on our way, particularly compared to the median. So hopefully we might see a little bit more precipitation, um, but it, I would guess that we're probably not going to achieve that 5.1 from last year. But uh, good to note that we are above what we saw um, or what we typically see for the median. And I, I tried to break it down using some tools. Uh, my confidence isn't the highest, but I think it was still good enough to provide this kind of context. So um, the 3.4 inches of precipitation that we have seen from uh, January 1 to now is about 148% of normal for this time, uh, for that period, right? Uh, so looking at this particular tool I used to, to figure this out showed that uh, it for the typical um, year for that median, we're, we typically accumulate about 2.3 inches of precipitation from January 1 through uh, January 22nd. So a good improvement. Again, these are it, this is relatively typical to see these types of accumulations, you'll see uh, a storm period for a week or two, and then things will dry out for a kind of week or two, maybe even three, and then we'll see a storm period where it'll look like um, uh, conditions have improved significantly, where, where in reality, it is that kind of stair step that we typically see. We get uh, questions from the media uh, regularly asking, you know, how much, uh, how impactful were, was the storm that we've recently seen? So I'd like to put that in, in context. And in more cases than not, um, the storms that we see are relatively normal. 148% of normal might look um, extreme uh, to some, but in, in reality, I'm trying to put it into context, it's, it's not uh, that spectacular. Good improvement, but like as I like to say, nothing really to write home about. 
Um, reservoir storage across the state as of November 1st was 100% of normal. Uh, just bringing that up because uh, since our last update and then here again, statewide as of January 1, reservoir storage uh, was 100% of normal again. So, so that's good. Um, and then here is the uh, long-term trace uh, showing here again that uh, these points are right on the median line, these uh, most recent observations. Another way of looking at uh, the major basins and reservoir storage across the state, um, you can see um, the reservoir storage uh, for this year in the uh, darker blue aqua line, and then compared to last year at this time, um, uh, where reservoir storage was. Sorry, I, I, uh, <laughs> uh, my heart skipped a beat um, in looking at December of 23, but that's the end of December, that is January 1. So that all checks out, that's the way it's supposed to be. Gets me every time. Uh, reservoir storage, looking at all of the major basins across the state, just looking at it in a different way, seeing where they stack up. Oh, sorry, and this was November 1, forgive me. Uh, the slide was November 1, and then here is January 1. Again, uh, reservoir storage for a whole, for the whole across the state is 100% of normal. Statewide stream flows as of October. I always like to put this in the presentation this time of year because uh, stream flows and anesthesia stream flows are an important indicator of uh, how thir thirsty the soils are. So whatever snowpack we see uh, winds up sitting on top of uh, those soil moistures. Those soil moistures are kind of indicated by the stream flows um, and, and shows that, you know, in the Colorado River Basin uh, with uh, stream flows being 116% of normal in October, uh, I wouldn't think that the soils are going to be so uh, hungry for the snow melt. So when the snow does melt, um, hopefully we will see a more efficient runoff. Hopefully, I think conditions can change over the course of the winter. Usually they don't change too much. Uh, but however, in the rest of the basins, we're seeing that there is uh, stream flows were low in October. And uh, that usually indicates um, some kind of soil moisture deficit. Um, so uh, could indicate that uh, the soil moisture will be hungry for moisture when snow first starts to melt and may um, uh, subdue some of that runoff uh, and, and in charging the soils. Stream flow forecast as of January 1, looking at it from a, uh... oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to update this one. I thought I caught them all. Uh, sorry, this is January 1, 2023. This was my red flag here, or blue flag in this case. So in summary, uh, snowpack right now is 92% of median uh, statewide. Uh, early January storms provided that boost, but it wasn't as much as we needed and said that a bunch of times. Um, at this point in the year, we're a little bit more than 50% of of uh, normal snowpack accumulation. So we have the other half of our, our snowpack to accumulate here. Um, hopefully we will see at, at least normal, if not more to make up for some of those deficits. Um, but we'll just have to see, as Peter mentioned, uh, sometimes those spring storms uh, can help out a lot, but um, they seem to be, uh, they seem to prefer certain portions of the state uh, has definitely been a trend in previous years. Uh, statewide reservoir storage is 100% of normal and uh, statewide precipitation is at 91% of normal. So that's the end of my presentation. Happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Brian. Hey, Brian, this is Nathan Elder with Denver Water. Can you talk a little bit about how your forecast model changed for this year? Um, and <clears throat> any background on, on that would be helpful. Sure. Um, so I would direct you to uh, Carl Wetlawfer and Gus uh, Goodbody. Uh, they're the ones who are, you know, kind of implementing it. Uh, Carl actually... Um, took a position with the Water and Climate Center. So he's no longer with the Colorado Snow Survey Program, but he's working for the snow, um, with NRCS and, uh, at the, our national headquarters. So I will give a brief 30 to 60 second uh, overview of, of what it is. Um, for all of the stream flow forecasts that we provide in Colorado, we have been transitioned uh, from 
our Viper forecast model to our M4 forecast model. Now, forgive me, I can't remember what either Viper or M4 stands for, but what the the M4 um, model has uh, not only it, it has increased the number of models that are used in helping in the predictions. So not only does M4 use the previous Viper technology, which is multiple linear regression um, and principal components analysis, but it also uses a number of other machine learning, um, a number of other um, regression analyses. And I can't remember the one other component now that you've put me on the spot, Nathan. Um, so. That's a very brief update. There are there's very long papers that have been written on the new um, the new M4 model. Uh, I think I can distribute that. I, I can check if if anybody's interested. Um, and and Nathan, have you visited with Gus or um, Carl on those on the new model? No, not not yet. Okay, great. Yeah. So the the best part about the new model is um, it is going to be seamless. There is not going to be any difference in the output. Uh, we're still going to provide the range of streamflow for or potential outcomes. Um, and the best part is, is it still uh, has the, the Viper and the multiple linear regression um, analysis as the basis for it. So uh, at a minimum, if, if the other technologies or the other forecasting uh, tools are, are uh, not operational for one reason or another, uh, the, the, um, Principal components analysis still still winds up holding uh, true and and being the forecast output. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, and you have Gus's information and and uh, Carl's information, right? You can reach out to him, or do you need me to provide that to you? No, I've, I've got it. Thanks. Appreciate Excellent. it. Excellent. Great question. Awesome. Well, thanks, Brian. And thanks, Peter. Um, great presentations. Um, I now want to open it up to the rest of the group. Any water managers, water providers, water districts um, to provide local local updates, local conditions. Sure, I can jump in for Denver Water. This is Jordan Soldano. Uh, right now, our reservoirs are about 84% full, and normal for this time of year would be 81% full. Uh, in terms of snowpack, uh, for the South Platte River, we're at about 94% of normal, uh, and in the Colorado Basin, snowpack's about 93% of normal. Um, so kind of in line with the presentations we saw today, we've seen a big boost of, uh, over the last couple of weeks, and hope it keeps going. Great. Thanks, Jordan. Anyone else want to provide an update? Hi, this is uh, Aldous from the National Weather Service. I just wanted to say there's some other things that we're looking at for February. Uh, there are some other teleconnections that are also indicating that it might be wetter than uh, normal. So we have, uh, uh, we'll get into the dirty details of it, but the two teleconnections are in a positive phase during that first part of February. So that, and that has a 85% or better correlation to wet conditions over parts of Colorado. So uh, that's, that's also a good indicator. So we're, we're hopeful. So there's some positive news I like to give. Um, just a little bit, uh, that departure from normal uh, temperature map that was shown by Peter, when I looked at some of the data, there were at least two stations that were warmer um, and it was overnight temperatures that were warmer. It still may be some data that could be bad, but it looked like uh, the analysis bumped it up warmer by two degrees over what the actual stations did. So the, it, it might've been warmer, but maybe not quite as warm in that area by Gunnison. And then uh, uh, just wanted to, we had some uh, ice jams form because of this colder temperatures too on some of the rivers, including the South Platte and the Arkansas and a few uh, smaller uh, smaller ice jams out in the Western Colorado. But we, we did see some ice jam. No, 
Uh, there was some flooding uh, issues on the Arkansas a little bit, and uh, South Platte it remained within its banks uh, just barely. There was a, one area by uh, um, in Morgan County that was right at bank full with that uh, ice jam, and they're starting to release as we warm up. So that's all I have. Thanks, Aldous. Thanks for that bit of good news too. Um, any any West Slopers want to provide an update? All right. Well, I'm hearing then. Um, it is one minute after the hour. So, um, oh. Yes. Hi, Adrian. Oh, I just have a, a, a quick, it's not really an update, but um, one of my stakeholders called a really cool video of an ice flow on the oh, San yeah. Miguel sort of coming down the channel right at you. Um, I'll just drop that in the chat and anybody that wants to check it out can watch it. Perfect. But that's all I got. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, all right. Well, that concludes today's meeting. Um, our next meeting will be on February 20th. Um, and thank you all for coming on and um, have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Everyone.